Alrighty, so we got one more game to finish up this match week, which will happen in just a little bit later, but that gives me a perfect time to do part one of the review of this match week. And, you know, as I mentioned in the preview, the good thing about this match week in terms of Saturday is that, you know, whatever happens in terms of the, the first eight games I'm going to review, it's going to be pretty much all Eastern Conference game, except for that one interconference matchup and then in part number to be pretty much all Western Conference games. So I like the fact that the schedule maker made it like that well balanced. And I might as well just call this review uh, reviewing all the Eastern Conference games except for that one interconference matchup that we saw. But the other thing that we also saw from these Eastern Conference matchup is that remember how in the preview I, I talked about some teams look like they look like they're they're dead and bare even though they're in the mix of the playoff race. Well, those teams probably heard that and they took it personally because all those teams that I mentioned that looked like they they were going the wrong direction, it looked like they're not going to make the playoffs, all them won, and that include Nashville. So I talked about how Nashville. You know, they look like they, they're heading the wrong direction. They're dead last in the Eastern Conference. Uh, they lost eight in a row coming into this game against Atlanta. And guess what they did? They come to Atlanta, get a get a 2 nothing win. Now, in the first half, Guzan would deny Bumberry as he pushed that one onto the post. But then in the fifth minute, Alex Mule would score from Surridge and Moore to give Nashville a one nothing lead. Uh, Silva did look to respond, but he was denied by Willis. And then Guzan had to deny Bumberry on the header, and then Bumberry would have a shot that was deflected and goes wide. I'll tell you what, if Teal Bumberry was not snake bin, Nashville would be at least two or three nothing up in this point. But it was all Nashville up to this point. Like you, you would have not guessed it that this team uh is in the midst of this long losing streak and, and are, are just just completely fall off a uh, cliff in these last two or three three months or or so. Uh, and then in the 39 minutes, Surge would put the ball into the back of net. Problem was, uh, the goal was to allow from offside on development play as VAR uh, took a look at it. But still, who are the Nashville team? Because this does not look like a Nashville team that ha are coming into this game with eight losses in a row. And I'm pretty sure Atlanta fans are probably asking the same question too because, you know, if you're Atlanta in the mi mix of the, this playoff race and in a game where you kind of say it's kind of a must-win win game because you're playing against a team that look like like they they might be down and, and out even though they're still in the thick of the, the play playoff race you have to to win this game and yeah now they found themselves one nothing down heading into the second half now in the second half it feels like atlanta kind of woke woke you know, whatever uh rob valentino said uh it kind of worked out a little bit and it feels like they got their acts together reels with heads at y uh or hits it right right to willis uh a much better start i fought for atlanta as they were pressing for the equalizer uh then willis would deny Marenchik. From close before Lobchenice would have a one hopper right to Willis on the free kick. And then the post would deny Rios uh in the 66 minutes. Again, Atlanta was pounding on the door. They were pressing the trot trying to 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 get get the equalizer. Nashville, they were looking like they were all on the ropes. But then in the 76 minute, really against uh the, the run of plays, Hani Mukta. It's hard to believe that that it's been a while since I've said that name on the goals scoring chart. I mean, a guy that has just completely looked like a shell of his old old self from that MVP kind of season that we, we saw from a couple of years ago. But he finally gets on, on the goal scoring chart. He scored here from Bunbury to make it 2-0 in favor of Nashville. Uh, again, I even wrote the drought is over. That is his first goal that he has scored for Nashville since April. It's hard to believe it's been that long since it score goal for this Nashville uh, uh, side. And also, it's not a penalty uh, too as well. That makes it even more impressive. But yeah, completely against the the, the run of play. And really came up with a classic Nashville uh, counterattack. Kind of very similar to what we see with Gary Smith team uh, with, with the way how, how they, they were able to score a goal from, from a classic Nashville counter that's been missing pretty much for throughout the, this losing streak. Uh, Marinchik did look to respond, but he hits it right to Willis. Uh, the boos were coming down hard again at, 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 at MBS. So if you thought that Atlanta fans were ha happy a after Gonzalo Pineda uh, was relieved of his duty, I mean, I'm pretty sure they were very happy about that. But on, on the field product, yeah, they're not happy about that, and I don't blame them. A 2 nothing loss to Nashville in a game that this this is going to come, come back to haunt Atlanta if they don't make it uh, to, to the playoffs. I mean, in a game where you're playing at home, and I know this season Atlanta has not been good at home, but you're literally playing against one of the worst teams uh, in the league and a team that just completely fallen apart in the last two months. And they don't get the win. I mean, yeah, it's no surprise the boos were raining down hard uh, inside MBS. But the shots in this one, 10 shots for both of these teams. Five shots on the ultimate of three that Nashville has. No shots off target with a three that Atlanta has. One shot on the ultimate of four that Nashville has. And possession-wise, 54% possession 
compared to the 46% possession that Nashville has in this game. Big win for Nashville in this one. And again, we'll see whether or not if that, that will kick off their, their, their season. Again, a lot of these teams that I, I, I kind of ridden them off, they, they got the win, and it feels like they're, they're doing this on purpose because, as I mentioned before, the Eastern Conference playoff race, it's going to be crazy. It's going to be down down the, the, the stretch. It, it's going to be, I think, more entertaining compared to the West because, as I'll talk about uh, tomorrow in part number two, it feels like the Western Conference, there's a little bit of bit of a buffer right 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 now that it is going on, but the Eastern Conference playoff race, it's going to be, be wild, and it's going to come down the, the stretch, and that I, I think it's safe to say that I can't really write off any any team even when teams are in a bad run of form somehow they found a win out out of nowhere and all of a sudden they're bunched up again now moving on in terms of the next match is the hell is real derby between cincinnati versus columbus now in terms of in terms of entertainment wise yeah this game definitely did not live up to to its hype and mostly due to the fact that you know most of these star players didn't really kind of play well in, in this one well i'll say that you know for columbus cucho did had a couple of chance but rossi was pretty much invincible in this one and you can say the same thing about lucho costa too pretty much a, a non-factor uh in this one but in terms of how it, it kind of played out overall i do feel like this was a playoff game this felt like a playoff game there was really not much in it and it, it, it kind of felt like it was one of those games where there's going to be an unsung hero that's going to score an amazing goal to 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 separate between both of these team and unfortunately we didn't ha had that though we did came close a couple uh, of time in this game now early on cincinnati had lots of possession uh with columbus look like they, they were sitting deep deep early in this one what's kind of interesting is that every every time when we see columbus we know this is a team that dominate possession but that is different when they play cincinnati cincinnati earlier this season they they were able to get more of the possession for columbus and and it's kind of interesting because of the way that you know both of these teams do they do love to play possession it's kind of like that cat and mouse game of who is going to be that team that is looking to not have possession possession because you can't have, have two teams that want possession and play each other and both team want to have possession at, at the same time so somebody's gonna have have to kind of really not have possession and maybe play on the back foot a little bit and columbus looked like they were elected to do so which is kind of odd considering the fact that cincinnati they they didn't they they had a makeshift defense i thought uh will for nancy will be a little bit more aggressive having more of the possession and really test uh the cincinnati makeshift back line as the the game goes along uh but there was no shots for the first 13 minutes of the game again it felt like a playoff game is very cagey early on the first shot of the game did see rossi miss an absolute sitter in the back post so i say rossi was kind of invincible uh, i take that back he, he did have some chances this is definitely the bigger one that he wants to have back and then salatano would deny ramirez on a 1v1 as columbus had definitely woke up they looked like they were pressing to get the opening go and this makeshift back line that cincinnati has it was on the the the, the rope so again I, at least you know from from the get get go with the way that Cincinnati had most of the possession. I'm surprised Columbus didn't do this more often, and they they kind of continue to not do this more often, where they just kind of sit back a little bit, letting letting uh, Cincinnati have more of the 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 possession. But uh, Kelsey would then puts it wide from close after the crew turned it over in their their own half. That would also be a theme for the Columbus crew in this game. Turnover has been a problem for for the the crew. I mean, I know they have it have an amazing season but if there's one thing that i'll say that if you're a crew fan that you're a little bit concerned if they want to defend their mls crown it's got to be those turnovers though those turnovers ha has has had has has caused problems we saw it in in the Leeds cup uh as well and we saw a lot in this game as as well in fact most of the chances that cincinnati has had wasn't really because they were creating they were just taking advantage of these bad turnovers that the, the crew has uh and then in the 38th minute we saw uh well actually before that uh oriana would hit it right to Schulte, and then we saw an interesting uh situation where camacho basically tapped kelsey down 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 uh off, off the ball and yeah yeah that that definitely woke up the the 25 000 inside to you and they they want a red car uh for for that they want a violent contact i didn't think there was much involved in. I, I think that would have been been harsh if it was it red and also there was no foul and yellow that was given kind of like your typical hell is real derby kind of a derby kind of kind of moment that, that that we saw in this game uh but Giacchini was then in on goal there but his shot was blocked in the 42nd minute uh that also came off another bad giveaway from Columbus which uh again again it's been a problem this season there's been times where they have been giving the ball away inexplicably at, at the back and as I mentioned it has come back to haunt them in a bit and then Acosta he did score in the 44th minute what the goal was this allowed for offside? That's pretty much the only involvement that Acosta would have pretty much in the entire game. And kind of the only time I mentioned Acosta name on the, on, on the board because, again, he was very, very quiet in, 
in, in, in this, this game. But we do head to halftime, scoreless between both of these teams. In the second half, Kucho would blast one into the Bailey from long range before Kelsey had a shot that was blocked off the line by Camacho. And this, again, came off of a bad turnover. This time, it's Schulte, the one play right into the path uh, of... Um, uh, right in the path of, of Lucho Acosta there, and that yeah, the crew again they're just dodging bullets left and right. There, there, it, it's it's crazy the fact that they were turning the ball over over and over again, and they weren't 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 being be, being punished. And in many ways, they they were probably lucky to do so because you know any of those free bad turnover that they they had could have been easily one nothing in favor of Cincinnati. Uh, Cucho then had a free header, but he missed high there in the 62nd minute. Yeah, that's one that Cucho wants to have back. You do not usually see him miss a free header like that. Uh, Oriano then puts it high on the on the curler. So Swatsky then hits it uh, right right to Sautano from the corner. And you just kind of feel like this is, this is one of those games where one goal looks like it's going to be enough to win the game. Or the fact that there's going to be no goal because it, there's really not much separated between both of these teams as we ex expected between these two very good Ohio teams. Uh, Powell would then puts it uh, wide from long range before Salatano had to deny Russell L Rowe on a redirection. And that was a big save there from Salatano because Russell Rowe did a good job to redirect that one. But Salatano make a big save there. And yeah, in the end, it ends in a scoreless draw in this one. Uh, I didn't think many people would have saw thought that this game would have ended in a scoreless draw with all the attacking talent on display in this game. But the shots in this one, 12 shots can be the 8 that Cincinnati has, 2 shots on goal for the 3 that Columbus had, 5 shots off target for the 4 that Cincinnati has, 2 shots that was blocked for the 4 that Columbus had, and possession-wise 50% for both of these teams. So another chapter of the Hell is Real Derby is in the books, and I would not be surprised we might see the, these teams again in, in the playoffs because, again, it just feels like whenever this this game has happened, even when when it comes to like entertainment wise, uh, uh in terms of the goal scoring, it w was not there and maybe be a little bit of letdown. It is still a very very intriguing game to a fact that you know these are two very good teams in the Eastern Conference, and there's a reason why I said said it before that it feels like feels like one of these teams is probably going to win the the East. I mean, no disrespect to Inter Miami that that is, but I, I do still feel like there's a chance that both of these teams, especially Columbus, I I think still have the better chances to to repeat as the Eastern Conference uh title, but don't write Cincinnati the off as well and that again, these two teams when they play against each other, it's going to be a very fun matchup and we'll see whether or not if we'll see it in the playoffs whether in in, in the quarterfinal or even once again in 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 the conference final uh, again. Now, moving on into the next game on this board is DC and NYCFC. So DC saw uh, what, what happened. Uh, well, actually, this game was taking place at the same time as the National Atlantic game is. So they had a big opportunity to, to get three points to not to really kind of control their own destiny. And they don't get it in this game against NYCFC. Now, early on, McVay would hit one right to freeze as the shots were 2 nothing for DC early uh, in this one, uh, Wolf, Wolf would then hits one right to Bono. By the way, there was some controversial call in, in this game as well as we get to. But one thing that's not controversial is there was a penalty that was given to NYCFC after O'Toole uh, was brought down by Santos there in the box. Yeah, that was clearly uh, a penalty there. And Santi Rodriguez steps up to take the penalty. He gone with the Penanca, coolly slotted home to give NYCFC a one nothing lead. And then, literally two minutes later, it looked like Pirani ties the game up. But VAR disallowed this goal for offside. And I'll tell you what, I look at it a couple of times. I just can't see how is this supposed to be offside. I, I, I just don't, 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 don't see it what, whatsoever. And again, this, 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 is, this is why I said earlier that there were definitely some controversial call. And then it feels like, like you know, if VAR is going to be bad in this game, it might as well be bad for both teams. Because literally 10 minutes later, uh, Alonso Martinez would put the ball into the back of the net. But the goal was this allow uh, for offside too, even though it was not offside. Martinez w was uh, level with the last defender. If anything, he was actually behind the, the last defender too. So yeah, that must be a makeup call after the one er earlier in, in in this one and that I mean I, I know that that's not gonna please uh both fan base when they see see bad calls that is being made but at least you could say that on on the high hindsight you know if you're gonna be bad in terms of making VAR call at least it's pretty much bad on both sides and I know that sounds cat not a good thing to say and it is not a good thing to say I don't want to see see games that have these bad calls that determine game but at least we don't have to ha have a situation where oh no it looks like one really bad call has just kind of ruined the night for a team and again the, 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 those two two goals probably should have counted and probably this game should have been 2-1 uh, in, in favor of NYCFC 
Uh, but that being said, we do head to halftime with NYCFC leading 1-0. Uh, in the second half, Martinez with fires it wide from close range before Freeze denied Stroud from close. I thought it was a lively start in the beginning of the second half as both of these teams pressed for the next go. Um, Priyarni then had a shot that was deflected and, and goes right to Freeze before Benteke would head it right to Freeze in the 61st minute. It was a pretty quiet night for Benteke, at least, uh, on the, the run of plays, but he did... Uh, get a chance to score another goal because there was a penalty that was given to DC as we are deemed that Sands brought down Kutibiecho in the box there. This one, I, I think it was it, it, it was uh, the, the, the right call there. But yeah, that gives the penalty for, for DC. And Teke, of course, steps up to take the penalty, trying to score his 19th goal, and he does. So that ties the game up at one apiece. Kutibiecho then puts one right to freeze. The momentum was with DC. They were pressing to try to get the... The lead here. Baji would then heads one right to freeze. And then uh, Miro would heads it right to freeze in the first minute of stoppage time. But yeah, in the end, it ends in a 1-1 draw on this one. Shots in this one. 12 shots with a 9 that NYCFC had. 3 shots on goal with a 7 that DEC had. No shots off target compared to 2 that NYCFC had. Both teams had 4 shots on his block. And possessed by 60% possession compared to the 40% possession that DC has in this game. And consider NYCFC hasn't been very good this season on the road. I mean, I guess they'll, they'll take this... Uh, point even though they had had their moments in this game and for DC I think it's kind of the same thing I think they'll, they'll take the, the point here but you know they're deep down they, they would feel like they probably could have got more especially when you're playing at, at home and you have had a chance to re really uh, uh, control your own destiny because Atlanta lo lost uh, in, in in their game against Nashville and they don't do do so and it's still kind of kind, uh, they still don't control their own destiny even though they're above the red line they do have that that play one more game over a lot of teams that is below them uh, in, in the red line right now. Now, moving on, in terms of the next match, is Miami and the Philadelphia Union. So, obviously, the big storyline of this game is the return of the NL Messi. And, yeah, it definitely seems like, like his presence w w was felt in a big, big way with the way that, yeah, you know, what's kind of interesting about this game is that I don't think the scoreline re really show, shows you how the, the fact that the Union really gave, gave Miami something to think about. I, I mean, it, I thought the Union played really well uh, in, in this game. And, you know, if Messi wasn't in this game, they probably would have got something out of it. But, unfortunately, Messi what was in this game. And uh, that being said, in the first half, literally just one minute into this game, just 52 seconds into this game, uh, the Union takes the lead. It's Mikel Uru, the one that gets the opening goal for the, the Union. It came off a bad turnover from Inter Miami, something that we have seen seen a lot. Uh, this season as well, especially with that make sure at time that back line has, has been very sh shaky. But yeah, that gives the Union a one nothing lead, a perfect start from them. Uh, Solvin would then puts it wide from close before Baribo uh, would hits it right to counter. Again, it's all Philly early in, 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 in this one as, you know, Miami clearly has not started on time in this one. And then there was a crazy sequence where uh, a bad back pass saw a counter came off his lines here and he was able to deny Uru, but he did Give up a rebound and it fall right into the path of Gastak. He had an empty net there, but he was denied by counter again. And then it falls to the Baribo uh, again, and he trying to hit into the empty net, but it, it, it was taken away. So, yeah, just, just some crazy se sequence. The the, the U Union will, will, will be definitely kicking themselves that they didn't score uh, in that day. And, again, another close call for Inter-Miami in this one. Uh, Baribo then then hits it right to counter. The Miami back line was all over the place early in in in, in this one. I mean, I, I get that you, of course, get the Golden Goose back. But that doesn't mean your back line needs to go back to, to what it was in the beginning of the season. Where, at times, this season, especially early this season, where their back line was, was a hot, hot mess uh, early in the season. But if there's one thing, like I said, you know, it, even though if Inter Miami is not playing very well in the back, a lot of those issues is, uh, is uh, base, basically mere uh, away because the, the greatest player of all time gets on the score sheet. So in the 26th minute, we saw with Messi scoring from Suarez and Alba. So a goal made from Barcelona happened in this one, just kind of completely against the run of plays. And then four minutes later, he scored again, this time from Alba and, and Wenger to make it 2-1 in this one. Just, again, completely against the run of plays, those two goals. And that if you're the Union, that has to be an absolute gut punch. But also, not the first time we've seen this happen. This is the thing about, about Inter-Miami, and this is the thing. When you face against Inter-Miami, you have to take these chances. If you do not take these these chances, it does not take much, especially with, with, with the GOAT uh, on, on the field. You don't take advantage of it, you are going to be pumped 
punished more times or, or not. Uh, Baribo did look to answer, but he hits it right to counter. And then he had a shot that was deflected and goes wide in 37 minute. Uh, again, good response for the Union. But the question is, can they get show that clinical finishing? Which, besides the, the first minute goal, that's been kind of been non-existent um, uh, up to that point. Uh, Rake then denied Suarez from close in the 40 sec second minute before Suarez. Looked like he made it 3-1 in, in this one, but uh, VAR actually disallowed this goal. Uh, for offside and I thought the Union got away with that one too because they themselves coughed up a bad turnover there of their own but we do have to have time uh, with Inter Miami leading 2-1 in this game. In the second half uh, Uru would flash it wide from, from close as the Union uh, were, were at it again, again, again with some promising start to, to the gate uh, to coming out of the break but can they get themselves the equalizer up to that point? Uh, well in the in the 60 Se seven minute uh Adenarin tried to do so but he heads it wide from close range Miami again they, they started to sit deep a little bit letting uh letting uh gaps even though they were, were sitting deep I mean that's got to be concerned if you're inter Miami the fact that you're still sitting deep and trying to be compact but you're still letting gaps uh for the union to exploit uh gas tag then hits one uh, uh, uh into the side inning before Elliot would hit one that was actually spelled by counter and he just about uh, gobble that one on the second attempt. I mean, there was a couple of Union players looking to pounce on the rebound there. But uh, in the, the seven minute of stoppage time, Luis Suarez basically called game. So he scored here from Messi to make it 3-1 in favor of Inter Miami. That's, that that just kind of show, shows you how, how unselfish Messi could be. I mean, he could have easily had a hat trick. The scoreline could definitely have been, been on in one scan on his return, scoring the hat, hat trick here. But just a lovely unselfish play there to pass it to to Suarez. Basically, Suarez had a tap in, in there. He's not going to miss that at any time, time in his career. And yeah, just like that, it's a 3-1 uh, lead for Inter Miami, and that would be the final score of this game. And again, the shots in this one just kind of tell, tells you the story of what happened when you don't 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 show clinical finishing against Inter Miami, because the Union actually had more of the shots. 20 shots with a 9 that Miami has. The shots on goal was still in favor of the Union. 5 shots on goal for the 4 that Miami has. No shots off target for the 7 that the Union has. 5 shots on his block for the 4 that Miami has. And possession wise, 60% possession compared to the 40% possession the Union has in this game. And again, after this this game, Jim Curtin and, and the Union fans will be absolutely free. Maybe frustrated with this game because again they, they were the better team in this game in my opinion for for most part of it but when you don't show that clinical finishing against Inter Miami and as I know it's I've said it many times before but that's that's kind of how it is when you're facing against Miami you have to take those chances because if you don't take their ch those chances more times or not they're gonna be clinical in terms of fin finishing because you know we know they have have some 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 great players up front that can can do so and the union are just kind of the latest victim of being the better team against inter Miami, but don't don't walk away with anything because they, the lack of finishing let them down but that being said i am now going to switch boards and look at the last four games to finish up the review of part one of this match week which i believe is match week number 32 so moving on we got montreal versus charlotte so like i said before montreal was another team that in the preview i thought i kind of ridden them them off because they've been in a very bad run of form but yeah just kind of out of nowhere they able to get a, a, a much needed win in this one their first win uh since july uh with a 2-1 win against charlotte now in the first half 10 minutes in the first shot of the game did see schwedetsky puts it wide from long range not much really happened in this one the shots were only one nothing for charlotte 15 minutes in uh corbo would then struck the post off the the free cake but then in the 23rd minute and this was a crazy seat sequence but uh Caden Clark would get on the score sheet here I don't think Caden Clark actually score at uh, a goal uh for for Minnesota doing his, his short time so this would actually be his first goal of the the season and his first uh for Mo Montreal and just like what I said about Mason Sintoy when he was with with Montreal and got traded from Minnesota thank you Min Minnesota yeah as Montreal fans would would say but yeah just a crazy sequence here uh where Kalina make three big save here he first robbed uh, Caden Clark, but then it just bounced uh, to uh, Joseph Martinez here, and twice uh, uh, Kalina was able to make a big save, but yeah, how many times we said, when you don't clear your lines, it doesn't matter how many saves your goalkeeper is going to make, uh, it's going to eventually go into the back then, and Clark really on the fourth attempt, able to put it in, and that's got to be frustrating if you're, if you're Christian K Kalina, making free great save here, but only let down because, again, that Charlotte back line, not clearing the their lines and then it got worse for Charlotte because just three minutes later 
Rice Duke would score from Edwards here to make it 2-0 in favor of Montreal. Kind of took a, a fortunate deflection there. But yeah, Montreal 2-0 up against a Charlotte team that, yeah, there's got to be some real concern if you're a Char Charlotte fan knowing that they have not played well in the last couple of games. Uh, Bada did look to answer, but he missed Y on the header. But then the 35th minute, they do get one back. And it's Tim Ring, his first goal uh, for Charlotte here. He scored from Westwood to make it 2-1 in favor of Montreal. Uh, Kalina then denied Duke on the curler. But we do head to halftime with Montreal holding the 2-1 advantage. Uh, in the second half, just like the first half, not much really chances coming out of the second half. Piet would hit one right to Kalina before Marshall Ruddy would put it over from close range as Montreal definitely started well in the second half. They were pushing for the third goal. Bakaro would then hit one uh, right to Kalina on the doorstep of goal. And really, as the time winds down, where in the world is the pushback for, for, for Charlotte? Like, again, I understand that this team has not had a good run of form, form late, lately, but where in the world is the pushback? Like, it feels like they just kind of gave, gave, gave up uh, in, in this game. And it looks like Montreal was looking to cruise to an easy uh, free point, something that they have not had in, in, in quite some while. Uh, Yankov then puts it wide off of the deflection before Kalina denied Cockrell in the front post. Patterson then had the last chance for Charlotte, but he puts it wide on the header. And in the end, Montreal, a huge win in this one. Really get themselves back uh, into the conversation now in the playoffs. Will be 2-1 two, two, win in this one. Shots of this one, 14 shots with a 10 that Charlotte has. Nine shots on goal compared to one that Charlotte has. Now, to be fair, uh, three of those nine came game in that one crazy sequence that we saw that eventually led to, to the opening goal of the game but still that that is is quite 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 alar alarming if you're a, a charlotte defense the fact that you gave up that many shots on on go goal two shots off target with a six that charlotte has three shots that was blocked with a two that montreal has and montreal had more of the possession 60 percent possession compared to 40 percent possession that charlotte has and just like what i said about nashville let's see what will this win really start it get Montreal uh, going and, and join join what is just, again, it, it just feel, feel, feels like it, it, it's been given this this season that the Eastern Conference playoff race is going to be very crazy. It's going to be down the stretch. Every team is going to be be in it uh, down down the, the 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 wire because every time I, I discount a, a, a team that looked like they're out, out of it, uh, they somehow pull off uh, a, a win out of nowhere and get themselves back into it. But for Charlotte, like, like I said, there, there has to be a lot of concern if you're you're Charlotte, and I said it in the 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 preview, and I'll say it again. Defense, it, it, the the cracks are, are are really start to to show, and it, it, when when that that is started to show, and with the way that this team team on the attack throughout the season has has shown shown not many quality, that's got to be a concern if you're a Charlotte fan, especially coming down the stretch where you know it's hard to believe we were talking about just a couple uh, uh, of months ago where the Charlotte team can be a dark horse, but it's kind of sad to see now that they're, they're starting to fade away and maybe reality is starting to set in uh, for them because we kind of knew that they weren't going to be a good team and now reality is starting to uh, smack right in their face near the end of the, the, the season. Now, moving on into the next game is Orlando versus New England. So, yeah, Orlando looked like they're they're, they're getting themselves back in, into the good form and right on, on Q, Q because, as I mentioned, Orlando hasn't really been playing well coming out of the Leeds Cup break, but it seems like they're they're back in form, getting a, a, a pretty easy 3 nothing win against New England. Uh, first shot of the game did see Mark Anthony K hits it wide from close, but then uh, Torres would put one into the stands before Ojeda would hit it right to Ivesic. Uh, Orlando definitely getting the momentum. They were the better team, at least early on, pushing to try to get the opening go. And after Enrique would put it wide from close range, they do get the opening go in the 23rd minute. Uh, it's Rafael Santos, a rare goal for him. He scored from Angulo and Ojeda to give Orlando a one nothing lead. And the reason why it's a rare goal is because it was a banger. It was a banger and, and, and a half, half that, that we saw. And unfortunately, uh, I, I want to say this is the goal of the week with a question mark, but we probably already know who it's going to be the goal goal of the week, as we'll talk about uh, in that out traffic game where we also saw a banger and, and a half that, that, that happened that is probably going to be instantly the goal of the week. Uh, but in the, the 28th minute, Cartagena tried to score his, his own banger, but he missed wide in the 28th minute. It was all Orlando up to, to this point. And just like what I said said about Caleb Porter, unable, unavailable in this game because he's been suspended because of the comments that he, he said in the last game, New England clearly has not showed up in this game. And that, that's got to be, 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 be concerning considering you're in the midst of a, a, a playoff race and to, to go, be completely flat like that, yes, that is not, not looking well for... For, for the Rams. And it gets worse for them because the penalty was then given to Orlando as their captain, Carlos Hill, would handball this one in, in the box. You know things are not going well for New England if their captain even make, 
and their most important player uh, make mistakes sakes as well but yeah uh that gives a penalty for for orlando fuck who torres steps up to take the penalty no he's not gonna miss and he buries that one to make it two nothing if they're orlando city even Sitch then denied ojeda from close range and yeah we had to have some with orlando all over new england in this one two nothing in this game and it kind of continue in the second half uh for holson would puts it wide from long range the post would then deny torres uh from close again just just like the majority of first half it was all orlando in this one it looked like they were pressing to get the third goal glace then denied heel on the free kick and then veroni would puts it wide uh, with an outstretched leg as new england finally woke up i mean it, it took 67 minutes but it looked like they finally got something going trying to maybe get one back torres would then hit it into the side inning but then the 70 fifth minute or actually yeah yeah in the 75th minute that that is well actually i think it's the 74th minute duncan mcguire basically they make sure that this game was all all, all done as he scored from ladero to make it three nothing in favor of orlando and yeah that was one that ivasic wanted to have back i mean that that was not a good goal ivasic clearly should have uh say saved that that one too but orlando wouldn't care they were up three nothing up to this point ladero trying to make it four nothing but he puts it high on the free kick, and then Galese denied Boateng, but gets a second crack at it, and he missed high there. Uh, Cartiana then puts it right to Ivisage, and then Veroni puts it wide from close, which kind of just sums up the night for New England. Just didn't show up in, in this game whatsoever, just like their head coach, Caleb Porter. So I guess maybe not having Caleb Porter on the sideline might might actually not be be a good thing uh, for, for, for New England because, yeah, this was a very uninspiring performance in, in a time where they, they desperately needed these these points to to stay within the playoff race they they don't they lose three nothing in this one shots in this one 20 shots with a 12 that new england has two shots on over the five that orlando has nine shots uh off target with a five that new england has four shots i was blocked with a three that orlando has and possession wise 50 percent uh for both uh, of these teams that so oh, i i said that you know new england looked like they're heading the wrong direction watch how next week they're gonna somehow get a win and 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 that again like i said the, the rule of this the, this playoff uh, uh, stretch, stretch or the 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 stretch part of the season of this playoff push is that nobody can can get too much separation uh in in that that Eastern Conference playoff race. So ideally, New England's probably gonna win the next game and then it's gonna be all bunched up again. Though I will say this: one team that got a big win that at least kind of separate themselves in the playoff race is Toronto FC. So as I mentioned, coming into this game between of all, all these teams and i think this game kind of just just shows you how there's definitely going to be more of a playoff push in the east compared to the west because you know right now i think there there is like a five point point gap between uh minnesota and dallas and also austin uh in the red line and even though we still have some games to go to go and minnesota as i'll mention tomorrow they still have some really tough games coming up up the this uh the this season yeah, you know, it's definitely not a, a, as competitive as what we see in, in the Eastern Conference. But at least Toronto did, did get themselves a huge ball offer with a 2-1 win in this one. And it kind of helped the fact that they got the early goal just seven minutes in this game. And it's their captain, Jonathan Osorio. It's been a while since he has scored a goal. But he scored here from DeAndre Kerr to give uh, TFC a one nothing lead. Uh, Austin actually want to have a handball uh, that, that happened in the box. It was not given. Uh, and the goal would, would stand. And TFC would take a one nothing lead that also would be the only shot we will have in the first 20 minutes not much chances would really create early in this one uh hedges then puts it sit right to johnson after tfc just didn't defend that corner well whatsoever they let that ball bounce in a dangerous area a couple times that that is an absolute no no go if you're defending a corner and then uh after johnson denied obreon from close range they did it again uh, on the following corner they let the ball bounce in a dangerous area and once again Again, Austin could not quite punish TFC because of that. And I even wrote, TFC not only is having a tough time defending corner and probably are very lucky not to be punished, but yeah, yeah, you, you gotta you, you got you gotta say that they, they cannot do that again. You cannot keep keep defending corners where you let the ball bounce in a dangerous area a couple uh, uh, of time and not to concede. But after uh, Rainwood hits it right to Johnson in the 28th minute, really completely against the run of play in the 30th minute, DeAndre Kern would score from the... L- L- Larea and Osorio to make it 2 0 in favor of TFC. Again, just kind of completely against the run of play because it looked like Austin had the momentum, and that really was a momentum killer because after that, Austin really didn't kind of have that momentum. Uh, Longstaff trying to make it 3 0, but he he uh, missed that one wide. And then Zardes looked like he did make it 2 1. Problem was, the flag did not agree with him, and he knew it too. I mean, as soon as he puts it into the back of the, the, the net, he knew he was in an all, all, offside uh, position 
option there. But uh, Kerr would then puts it wide from close before Johnson denied Bakari in the near post. I think it was kind of end-to-end action at times. I mean, this game at times was very entertaining uh, to to watch. But uh, both of these teams were looking to try to get a goal before halftime. But we do head to halftime with TFC leading 2 nothing In the second half, uh, Ringwood puts one right to Johnson before Insigne would puts one right to Stuver. That also kind of came off with, with a bit of an end-to-end -end action. And again, just both you look, they picked off where they left off near the end of the half. It was very end-to-end. -end. Though the game did kind of start to, to slow things down. And I thought that 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 is what Toronto need, needed. I mean, TFC really need, needed this game to not be like just just, just like an out Trafico kind of track me kind of, kind of game. Because, you know, when you're leading, you do not want a game that is kind of end end to end whatsoever uh but in the 74th minute O'Brien would miss Hyde on the header but then in the 75th minute Austin get a lifeline as Owen Wolf would score from Heinz Ike to make it what what or make it 2-1 in favor of TFC and yeah this this was just a simple long ball that Heinz Ike basically lobbed it up and while it was a great long ball there from him to play Wolf in yeah you got to question the defending there from TFC just ball watching defending there from from TFC not good in, enough and they were punished because of, of that. Uh, O'Brien then looked to tie it, but he was denied by Johnson before uh, Rubio would put one wide from close range. TFC was just holding on for dear life. Like, like Austin uh, was, was really pushing hard to try to get the equalizer. But in the end, Toronto just about provide the, 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 the Los Verdes onslaught as they get a big 2-1 win in this one to at least give them some briefing room above the red line. The shots in this one, 10 shots for the 15 that Austin had, 8 shots on goal for the 4 that TFC had, 6 shots off target for the 3 that TFC had, 3 shots that was blocked compared to the 1 that Austin has and possession wise 53% possession compared to the 47% possession that Toronto has in this game. And I thought Austin played play well uh, in, in this one and in some way they kind of won the expectancy battle but if you ask any Austin fa fans and, and, and if you have watched Austin all this season it's not not great news when they win the expensive battle because this is one of the teams that has this kind of weird weird pattern where when they do win the expensive battle they're not going to win the game if they do lose the expensive battle and they lose it really badly they somehow win win, win the game that's just kind of how 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 it it, it is this this season so yeah when they have those chances and when they have those shots it's almost like like if you're a Los Verdes fan, yeah, we don't want to see that because that means that we're probably gonna lo lo lose because we are we are not being. Uh, this is one of those games where where we're just not being clinical in in, in front of goal. There's really no between. That's what, that's why if, if you're an Austin fan, you have to be very frustrated because the inconsistency ha has to be, be 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 just kill killing this team's chances in terms of of potentially making the playoffs. But now moving on into the last game on this board, and what a fitting way to kind of kind of conclude the talk about the last game by talking about what I, I've said in the beginning where every time where I, I write some of these team off and Chicago look like one of those team that I wrote, wrote off because they're going with their 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 typical September uh, collapse they get a big 2-1 win in this game against the the New York Red Bulls now early on the first shot of the game did see Shroud puts it over from close as I thought the Red Bulls were on the front foot but that doesn't mean anything because you know that 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 is their finishing going to be be good in this game this flash alert, it was not good again in this game as well. Uh, the first shot for the fire did did see uh, Kuypers hits that, the side ending before Morgan had a shot that was deflected and goes wide. The shots were free too for the Red Bulls early in this one. Uh, Barlow would then puts it high from close range in the, the 19 minute. By the way, it is very rare to see Tom Barlow starting for the Chicago Fire. I wonder if Frank Copas did this on purpose because they're, they're facing against the Red Bulls. And if he did... Well, guess what? It worked because in the 31st minute, of course, it has to ha happen. I mean, on it, honestly, uh, I think, think coming into this game, you would have kind of almost bet the fact that Tom Barlow is going to score because it's again his former te team, and you you know the script writer in MLS this season could be be as fire as some of the NFL script writer because here in the 31st minute, he scored his first goal for the Fire. So yeah, that made it uh, one nothing in favor of the Fire. To be fair, it was it was kind of a tap in goal. It was actually originally a good save, but. Barlow was just in a right spot to pretty much tap tapped it in. I mean, even as Snape in as Tom Barlow can be, he's not going to miss that ca kind of chance. And yeah, again, it, it, you knew it has. If he's going to score a goal, which doesn't happen very often, you know it's going to be against his, his former team. And and also, not surprisingly, after he scored the goal, he didn't celebrate what what's whatsoever because again, yeah, I mean, he 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 he's a guy that's been been with the Red Bulls pretty much throughout his his, his whole whole career. Career and for the better or or, or for the for for the worse, he, he's obviously not going to celebrate against his old team because of, of that. But that yeah, we do 
head to halftime with the Fire leading 1-0 because after that, there was really not much happened for, for the rest of the first half. And in the second half, the Red Bulls waste no time to tie the game up as uh, Youngberg would score uh, from Van Zier and Edelman to tie the game up at at one apiece, uh, Nealis then puts it over from long range in the 50th minute. Like the first half, the Red Bulls started the second half well. But again, finishing, it, could, could that be, be solved? I mean, at least they were a little clinical two minutes into the second half. But are they going to be, be able to, to be better finishing for the rest of the game? Uh, well, in the 55th minute, Mueller would hits one uh, right to Cornell in the 55th before Reyes would hit, hit, hit it uh, wide from close range. Uh, Brady then denied... Uh, Harper from from close before Morgan would puts it over from long range and I mean wrote yeah it, it feels like it's one of those nights again for the Red Bulls where they just cannot finish even though they're getting the the chances to do so but in the 74th minute Cornell would deny Kutsias from close range but then one minute later he would not not save this one from Kutsias uh because he scored here from Acosta and Halle Selassie to give the fire a a 2-1 lead. Uh, Nealis did try to tie it in third minute stoppage time, but he heads it wide from close. Uh, Red Bulls was pushing late to try to get the equalizer. Caballo had a chance to do so, but he just flashed that one wide from close range. But in the end, fire a big 2-1 win in, in this one. At least kind of pausing their, their typical September collapse narrative uh, for this game as well with a big win to get themselves at least kind of back in the playoff conversation. The shots in this one, 12 shots committed 15 that the Red Bulls had. Two shots on goal committed 5 that the the fire has. I mean, that's not a big surprise. Again, the Red Bulls are just pretty much, for most part, snake bin in front of goal. Six shots off target for the four that the fire has. Two shots that was blocked for the four that the Red Bulls had. And possession-wise, 51% possession compared to the 49% possession that the fire has. And while the fire definitely had some some life coming out of this game, if you're you're the Red Bulls, I mean, they're pretty much like like Charlotte fan. There has to be a lot of concern now because it, it feels like that that's that so metro moment is going going to happen to a point where. They're, they're just almost started to self self collapsing themselves near the end of the, the season. And anytime when you go and in, in, in the end of the season, even if you make it to the playoffs and you're you're, you're basically co collapsing late, you're probably not going to go too deep. And if it just feels like this Red Bulls team have one 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 and done in the playoffs, written all over it again, and that's got to be frustrating if you're a Red Bulls fan. Consider it. the the start that they had this season, it looked like things were going to be, be be promising, and now it feels like that that's so net metro narrative at least heading into the playoffs uh is probably going to happen once again but there you have it that is pretty much it in terms of me looking at all of these games from match week uh number 32 as always let me know in the comments below what do you think of the these games and again there's one more game that's going to be happening and it's going to be seattle versus sporting kc that's going to be kicking off uh, about two hours at the time of this recording and uh, of course we'll do an individual uh review of, of that game since that's the only game that's on today but until then hope you guys enjoyed this video if you do make sure you guys will like smash the subscribe button and also uh, i will do the the review of part number two look at the western Co conference game of this match week tomorrow as well but as i said until then hope you guys enjoyed this video if you do make sure you guys will like smash the subscribe button and yeah i of course will see you guys next time